Isulong natin ang pagkakaisa ng uring manggagawa at mawas na sapa ang aking sandigan sa pakikibakaw tungo sa pangbansang demokrasya silang nagtataglay ng tunay na lakas na luturog sa imperialismo burokrata, kapitalismo, feudalismo ang mga salot na pumapatay Revolusyong sosyalista Hanggang mapawi ang pagsasamantala Isulong natin ang pagkakaisa Nang uring manggagawa at makasasaka Ang ating sandigan sa pakikibakaw Tungo sa pambansang demokrasya Silang nagtataglay ng tunay na lakas Na duburong sa imperialismo Burokrata, kapitalismo, feudalismo Ang mga salot na pumapatay Mula sa mundo at tayo Parang alon tayong susunong Kukukubi at palalayain Natin ang kalunsuran At ating itatatag Ang isang lipunang malaya sa isang revolusyon sosyalista Hanggang mapawi ang pagsasamantala At ating itatatag Ang isang lipunang malaya Sa isang revolusyon sosyalista Hanggang mapawi ang pagsasamantala Isulong natin ang pagkakaisa Nang uri manggagawa at mawas na sapa Ang ating sandigan sa pakikibakaw Tungo sa pangbansang demokrasya Silang nagtataglay ng tunay na lakas Na luturog sa imperialismo Burokrata, kapitalismo, feudalismo Ang mga salot na pumapatay Sosyalista Hanggang mapawi ang pagsasamantala Isulong natin ang pagkakaisa Nang uring manggagawa at makasasaka Ang ating sandigan sa pakikibakaw Tungo sa pambansang demokrasya Silang nagtataglay ng tunay na lakas Na duburog sa imperialismo Burokrata, kapitalismo, feudalismo Ang mga salot na pumapatay Mula sa mundo at tayo Parang alon tayong susunong Kukukubi at palalayain Natin ang kalunsuran At ating itatatag Ang isang lipunang malaya sa isang revolusyong sosyalista Hanggang mapawi ang pagsasamantala At ating itatatag Ang isang lipunang malaya Sa isang revolusyong sosyalista Hanggang mapawi ang pagsasamantala
Sulung natin ang pagkakaisma Nang uri mang gagawa at mawasasapa Ang ating sandigan sa pakikibakap Tungo sa pangbansang demokrasya Silang nagtataglay ng tunay na lakas Naluturok sa imperialismo Burokrata, kapitalismo, feudalismo Ang mga salot na pumapatay Sosyalista Hanggang mapawi ang pagsasamantala Isulong natin ang pagkakaisa Nang uring manggagawa at magsasaka Ang ating sandigan sa pakikibaka Tungo sa pambansang demokrasya Silang nagtataglay ng tunay na lakas Na dumurog sa imperialismo Burokrata, kapitalismo, feudalismo Ang mga salot na pumapatay Mula sa mundo at nayong parang alon Tayong susunong kukukubi at palalayain Natin ang kalusuran At ang... Philippines. We are your hosts for today's launch of the second book in Jose Maria Season's reader series of selected writings. The first book la launched last month featured five decades of his writings on art, literature, and culture. The book today has a seemingly daunting title on the philosophy of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. But relax lang, because when we talk about philosophy, we talk about the love of wisdom knowledge, and how we answer questions and solve problems. Yes, we talk about the importance of three philosophers, Karl Marx, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, and Mao Zedong. As thinkers and doers, they teach us that another system is possible for the 99%, for the working class, for all those talking about revolutions, and for all those who believe in alternatives to a world driven by profit. Remember, Sarah, how uh, Marx wrote, the point is not only to interpret the world, but to change it. The book we are launching today is a great contribution to understanding them and a powerful tool in shaping society. Definitely, Chico. The Philippines has the long and fascinating history of how the words of these philosophers were uh, put into practice. And so now to start the program, let's hear from no less than the author himself about um, how he responded to their legacies while helping build the struggle for nationalism and democracy. An analyst, an always youthful teacher of philosophy, and a continuing student of people struggle and movements, let us welcome Professor Jose Maria Sison. Dear friends, I'm deeply pleased and highly honored by the international launch of my book on the philosophy of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. I thank the organizations sponsoring this event, the distinguished book reviewers, and all others who are participating. I appreciate the International Network for Philippine Studies for publishing this book in the Season Reader Series and for making it available to academics, activists, and other readers through international e-publishing outlets and the popular bookstore in the Philippines. 
The overall guide of the People's Democratic Revolution in the Philippines is the universal revolutionary theory of the proletariat, Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. It is therefore necessary for those interested in this revolution to read and study the book that is now being launched. The class analysis of the history and current social circumstances, the basic problems of the people, the revolutionary forces in motion, the strategy and tactics and socialist direction of the ongoing revolution are most profoundly and comprehensively understood by studying the philosophy of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. I am confident that the book reviewers will be able to draw attention to major points of significance and relevance in the book in order to arouse further interest in reading and studying the contents of the book. Once more, my most heartfelt thanks to all of you. Thank you, Professor Sison, for sharing your thoughts on the philosophy of MLM. Uh, we're looking forward uh, to the whole book. Uh, we also invite all of you out there to send him questions through the comment box on YouTube or Facebook and in the chat box of Zoom for our conversation later. how these philosophers um, have actually put their polit political philosophy in poetic verse. Let us now hear from cultural workers, Jen Brinkman and Noel Saturai recite poetry written by Marx and Mao and a poem on Lenin. The rock wings fan wise, soaring 90,000 li and rousing a raging cyclone. The blue sky on his back, he looks down Survey man's world with its towns and cities. Gunfire licks the heavens, shells bit the earth. A sparrow in his bush is scared stiff. This is one hell of a mess. Oh, I want to flit and fly away. Where may I ask? The sparrow replies to a jeweled palace in Elfland's hills. Don't you know a triple pack was signed? under the bright autumn moon two years ago. There'll be plenty to eat, potatoes piping hot, beef-filled goulash. Lenin Stocks are winding nonsense. Frontiers Look, cannot bar him. The world is being turned upside down. Lenin walks around the world. Frontiers cannot bar him. Neither barracks nor barricades impede, nor does barbed wire scar him. Lenin walks around the world. Black, brown, and white receive him. Language is no barrier. The strangest tongues believe him. Lenin walks around the world. The sun sets like a scar. Between the darkness and the dawn, there rises a red star. Never can I perform in calmness what has seized my soul with might but must strive and struggle onward in a ceaseless, restless fight. All divine enhancing graces would I make of life a part, penetrate the realms of science, grasp the joy of song and art. Let us do and dare our utmost, never from the strife proceed, never live in dull inertia, so devoid of will and deed. Anything but calm submission to the yoke of toil and pain, come what may, then hope and longing, deed and daring still remain. Darum lasst uns alles wagen, nimmer rasten, nimmer ruhen, nur nicht dumm so gar nichts sagen und so gar nichts wollen und tun, nur nicht brütend hingegangen, ängstlich in dem niedern Joch, denn das Sehen und Verlangen Und die Tat, die bleibt uns doch. We have just listened to Two Birds, a dialogue by Mao Zedong, Lenin by Langston Hughes, and Sensation by Karl Marx. Thank you, Jen and Noel, for the wonderful poetry reading. Sarah, alam mo ba na 
uh, Jen read the Marxist uh, poem in the original German text, Darum lass uns alles wagen, or roughly translated, therefore let us dare do everything. I think in the Filipino context, that would be uh, dare to struggle or dare to win. This poem speaks of the need for us to risk everything to undertake action, not just to wish nor brood, but to action. Okay. I did not know, but it's good to know. Um, but hey, Chico, do you do you uh, do you see these uh, revolutionaries or philosophers and uh, poets as well, like Marx, Lenin, and Mao? Uh, Professor Season wrote articles and uh, statements, interviews, and poetry understood by the masses and studied by intellectuals from different generations. Uh, together, uh, these become a powerful force to defend ourselves against attacks and overcome challenges to advance the struggle. Yes, thank you. Um, now, let us hear what our three guest reviewers have to say about the book. Sure. Our first reviewer is from the Congress of Teachers and Educators for Nationalism and Democracy, Best Teachers Org my org and is a core group member of the Philippine Ecumenical Peace Platform, which advocates for justice and peace. Let us all welcome and hear from Professor Jerry Imbong. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the editor, Julieta de Lima, and the author for inviting me to review his latest publication. I congratulate Professor Sison for it, for the second part of uh, Sison Reader book series. It is a great honor to be part of this book launching, especially that the contents of the book are very much in line with my field of philosophy. I first heard of Professor Sison during my high school days in the late 80s in Cebu. Back then, I was actively involved in a cultural group in our parish. It was also during that time that I was initiated to the student movement. During weekends, we would discuss, you know, the, the, the gospel. We would do some gospel reading, Bible study. And afterwards, we would collectively study also PSR, or the Philippine Society and Revolution. That was my first uh, encounter with Professor Chisong. My second encounter was when I was in the seminary from 1996 to 2004. Together with fellow seminarians and junior religious sisters, we would discuss some of uh, Professor Chisong's writings, especially during our exposure immersions to various sectors. By studying his work, I was able to apply the Christian faith to concrete conditions in our apostolate areas. When I left the seminary in 2004, I was fortunate enough to find a teaching position at the Colegio de San Juan de Letran in Intramuros, Manila. During my first three years, I taught theology. However, uh, I decided to transfer to the social science area since my master's and PhD is in the field of philosophy. Letran boasts of his famous alumni in various fields of specialization. In its 400 years of existence, Letran has produced prominent leaders from top government officials, media and legal personalities, businessmen, heroes of the revolution, educators, men of cloth, and even saints. One common thread that binds all these exceptional figures is the unwavering love for God and country propelled and animated by Letran's ideal of Deus Patria Letran. Jose Maria Sison is one of the greatest political theorists Letran has produced. As a revolutionary, he stands alongside Apolinario Mabini, and Emilio Jacinto, uh, both notable Latran alumni. As a poet, writer, and artist, he joins the ranks of other famous Latran alumni like Francisco Balagtas, Bienvenido Lombera, and Rolando Pino. 
in 2018, I submitted a research proposal as part of uh, Letran's quadricentennial celebration. I submitted a research proposal to Letran Research Center to do a research on Professor Sison's political philosophy. There were those uh, other colleagues from the department no, who did research work on the life and legacy of other famous Letran alumni like Bienvenido Lombera and Rolando Tinio. So I decided to do no, a separate research on Professor Sison. Since the research was about political philosophy, I immersed myself with Professor Sison's works, reading some of his major works. And this was my third encounter with Professor Sison. During the course of my research, I was also able to interview regarding his views on critical theory by the Frankfurt School. The excerpt of this interview is included in this present volume. I came to know more about Professor Sison when I became a core group member of the Philippine Ecumenical Peace Platform or PEPP. As a church-based peace advocate, we would always welcome Professor Sison's initiatives to pursue the peace process. We admire his passion in advancing the peace talks. Bishop Bert Kalang of the Iglesia Filipina Independiente, my co-worker at PEPP, would always tell stories about his experiences with Professor Sison and other NDFP consultants in Europe. As peace advocates, we were saddened by the Anti-Terror Law Council's inclusion of Professor Sison and his wife, Julie, in the list of designated terrorists. Reading the essays contained in this book made me realize, first and foremost, the importance of philosophy in our work as members of the academe and as social activists. As the title suggests, the current volume is about philosophy or the link between philosophy and politics. The French philosopher Alain Badou argues that philosophy should be conditioned by, quote, actually existing forms of politics. This means that philosophy must be able to be at the service of politics, which should lead political activists and militants with an answer to the classical question, what is to be done? This is exactly what the present volume delivers. The essays found in this book provides us with answers to the question, what kind of philosophy must we adopt? And how can philosophy be at the service of politics? The present volume is an antidote or an antithesis to what the French Marxist or yeah, philosopher Louis Althusser calls passive or resigned philosophy. The philosophy found in this book is an active philosophy. When you say active philosophy, that is philosophizing, submitting to the order of the world, because we know that the order of the world can change. It is dialectical. In this second sense, the take the, to take things philosophically has to do with knowledge of the rational necessity of the course of the world or evolution of history. It is putting philosophy to work in a practical way. The collection of essays and articles in this book is an affirmation for all the historical, theoretical, and practical reasons that the time is right and the moment is favorable, favorable for taking critical stock of the state of MLM philosophy. Arguably, this book is able to demonstrate MLM's revolutionary nature and how to put it into work, putting it into work without delay on various scientific problems, some of which have direct bearing on the class struggle today. This fine work is an outcome of more than four decades of conceptualizing and appropriating the universal, universal theory of the proletariat. If it is true, as the Marxist and psychoanalyst Eric Fromm postulated, that Marx's writings and thought has been given a one-sided treatment and distorted interpretation, emphasizing only the economic aspect of his teachings and little on the philosophical humanist aspect, 
then this present work is a visionary response to this diagnosis by amalgamating the materialist philosophy found in the works of Marx, Lenin, and Mao. Professor Zizon highlights the basic philosophical assumption that one must start not with man's ideas, man's consciousness, but with the real man and the real conditions of his life. This seminal work, uh, the work on Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought as guide to the Philippine Revolution, narrates the historical process of applying MLMZT in concrete circumstances of the Filipino people. It starts with an analysis of Philippine history and society, affirming the semi-colonial, semi-feudal character of present-day Philippine society. Subsequent topics deal with refuting the errors committed by revisionist, renegade party members such as right opportunism, left opportunism, bourgeois subjectivism. The fierce ideological struggle within the party eventually led to the publication of a comprehensive and important documents of the party. These are, uh, reaffirm our basic principles and rectify errors and other important documents. An in-depth exposition and discussion of Marxist philosophy are found in the article A Comment on Dialectical Materialism, Idealism and Mechanical Materialism, some questions on dialectical materialism, on dialectical materialism, uh, first of a series of webinars on Tisson's basic principles of Marxism, Leninism, and so forth. No, there are other uh, very informative and interesting articles you can find there, like dialectical and historical materialism, a review. These are uh, all philosophical in nature. What weaves these philosophical essays together, and perhaps the greatest contribution of the work, come from its emphasis on the unity or fusion between theory and practice. Acknowledging the primacy of practice, the author asserts that philosophy's role is to raise actually existing practices to the level of theory. Interestingly, this volume contains four articles that deal with the church involvement in the fight for social liberation as well as a critique of its ideological underpinnings. These are uh, the articles no, that deal with these topics are the role of the church in social change, ideologies in the Philippines, Sophism of the Christian social movement, and ideology and religion in the Philippines. These four articles can become useful tools for church people as they continue to link arms with the basic sectors of society in their struggle for building a truly just democratic and free society. As the author suggests, at the philosophical level, there are the basic principles that completely differentiate Marxism, Leninism, Maoism from either of these two, that is Christianity and bourgeois realism. But at the political and social level, there are grounds of dialogue and cooperation for those who are patriotic and progressive. Lastly, on the philosophy and Marxism Leninism, Maoism, the book is a timely response to the increasing demonization and vilification of activists and revolutionaries in the country. The series of malicious red tagging and consequently the harassment, threats, and intimidations that accompany it calls for a more resolute and persistent political and ideological work in order to disseminate these marvelous ideas to the mass, to the vast majority of the Filipino people and apply these in their everyday struggle for social liberation. After all, as Mao <laughs> reminds us, social practice is the only criterion for truth. Thank you, and once again, good afternoon. Thank you, Professor Imbong. Taka, okay, um, let's do isang bagsak, but let's not do it on the table or else our camera will, will move. So let, let's Everybody put their hands out like this. Raise your hands. One bagsak for Professor Imbong. Go. Okay, one more time, one more time. That was just practice. One more time, one more time. Put your hands out. And one bagsak for Professor Imbong. Okay. Our second reviewer is a uh, translator, an interpreter, uh, a writer, and a political activist 
Her novel, uh, Sovietica, is about life in the USSR and can be read in Russian, French, Dutch, English, and Sinhalese. Let us hear from uh, Irina Malengo. Uh, I have the honor of reviewing uh, Professor Sison's newest book on Marxism, Leninism, and Maoism philosophy. Um, it is a great book in the sense that it, it is a collection of his works on the topic of philosophy of Marxism, Leninism, and Maoism for the last 50 years, which is a very substantial period of time. It's important, first of all, uh, because of the growing importance of the revolutionary theory for the international communist movement. Uh, in our modern times, there are far too few authors uh, who properly and deeply develop revolutionary theory in our concrete modern conditions, because unfortunately many younger comrades in different countries uh, still lack the deep theoretical knowledge of the classic works. In this sense, this book could not be more timely. We live in a period of great changes. We feel it every day. Uh, Professor Sisson stressed in his uh, various work in, uh, war works in, of the uh, uh, last uh, few years that uh, this is the eve of upcoming great revolutionary changes and we should be well prepared uh, for them. It is our duty to acquire the necessary knowledge in order to defeat the decaying capitalist system and to build the new better world. And I think this book is an excellent instrument for us to achieve this uh, knowledge that we will need so badly. Uh, as Professor Sisson correctly states, uh, having the materialist scientific outlook and applying dialectical materialism facilitate the understanding of all matters and the solution of problems in the revolutionary process. So it is really essential for us uh, to have a proper knowledge of the revolutionary theory. There are works collected in this book which are aimed at audiences with various levels of knowledge of the revolutionary theory, from the basics to a uh, much more uh, deeper uh, analysis of various Marxist books. So, uh, with, if we start from the basics, I can mention here such work, uh, works as Basic Principles of Marxism-Leninism, written in the 1980s, on Proletarian Standing Outlook, Introduction to Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, which was uh, written uh, very recently this year, in January this year. And of course, if we look at in-depth analysis of such classic works as On the Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State by Friedrich Engels, and also the discussion of anti during by Friedrich Engels and general views of Lenin's theory of modern imperialism, all of these are excellent examples of how um, revolutionary theory can uh, be not just uh, studied, but also developed in our modern times. It's about reviewing and further developing basic principles, as Professor Chazon correctly states. This book also gives us, as foreign comrades, a good guidance in the history of the revolutionary movement in the Philippines in the context of Marxist, Leninist, and Maoist, uh, Maoist teachings. It's important not only for, for the young people in the Philippines themselves, but also for comrades in other countries, as it allows us to learn from each other's experience of struggle. And uh, Professor Sison's uh, works show how Revolutionary theory is applicable in the concrete practice of the Philippines. Many of those things are not well known in other countries, particularly in Eastern Europe, so I think it would be great if uh, our Eastern European comrades could familiarize themselves with those works. I think also the experience of the rectification movement in the Philippines is particularly interesting and important for our comrades in Eastern Europe today because, uh, unfortunately, in, uh, when it comes to Marxist, Leninist, and especially Maoist uh, philosophy, there are some uh, deep divisions. On, as a lot of people in Eastern Europe these days, uh, people of my age and older, um, because we studied Marxism, Leninism um, at universities, we, uh, a lot of people think we know it all, but 
Uh, in fact, uh, quite often our knowledge is uh, superficial and uh, not really uh, tied to practice. So I think we have a lot of work to do in Eastern Europe in relation to this. So we need work, uh, we need such books as this one. Uh, also very important for us uh, is the um, question on the Mao Zedong thought on Maoism. Uh, because simply in Eastern Europe we lack knowledge of Mao's works. We lack it very badly. Uh, when I read uh, Kajoma's tribute to the great communist Mao Zedong, written in 1976, it brought a lot of personal memories for me. I was uh, nine when Comrade Mao passed away. I remember because it was in uh, September, the school year just started. At that time, I didn't know much about him, probably like young people in Western Europe today, in Western Europe as well, uh, know very little about Stalin and a lot of uh, uh, very negative opinions and so on. Uh, that's because uh, the relationships between Soviet Union and China at that time, you know, at the time of Comrade Mao passing away, was at its lowest point probably. So there was no opportunity for us to familiarize ourselves with his teaching. Uh, in this sense, uh, it's very important uh, to realize the, um, what we are lacking by not knowing uh, Comrade Mao's works. As uh, Professor Sisson correctly points out, uh, Maoism is the third stage of the development of the universal theory and practice of the revolutionary proletariat. The great contributions of Mao and the six components of Maoism will always stay in the history of the revolutionary movement. Uh, he writes also that uh, we should underscore Mao Zedong thought as the further development of Marxism-Leninism. And it actually, uh, I must thank our Filipino comrades and Kajoma personally that I actually began to read uh, Comrade Mao's works. Thanks to you, I realize now that there is a need to break through in this uh, continuing uh, dismissive attitude toward co Comrade Mao work even am among communists in Eastern Europe, as it still often happens. We overcame this about Stalin because Stalin's works were also not available to general public during the Brezhnev years. And I think now we can and should overcome this sort of attitude towards Comrade Mao's works as well. This will allow us uh, to enrich our theoretical knowledge and also practical knowledge of how to apply it in the struggle how to evaluate properly the mistakes of our own past that could have been prevented. Um, Soviet bureaucrat communists after Stalin were quite often um, arrogant and a bit chauvinistic, even though they would have denied it. Hence this attitude that only uh, our Soviet theoretical works were correct and this dismissive attitude towards works of comrades from other countries. And today we are paying the price, among other things, for this kind of attitude. What I also find particularly inspiring in uh, Kai Joma's newest book is that it's not just about theory, it's, uh, it's uh, about detailed application of this theory in practice. Uh, in such works as Build the Bolshevik uh, Type of Party and Revolutionary Mass Movement, Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought as a guide to the Philippine Revolution development, uh, and sorry, in development, current status and prospects of Maoist theory and practice in the Philippines. Uh, I was actually uh, present at some of the webinars that you had recently on uh, on works of Engels and on dialectical materialism and historical materialism. And uh, in a way, it brought me a little bit back to my student days in Soviet Union. Uh, I must admit that during those days uh, I found particularly challenging to understand the concept of dialectical materialism. Um, but now, uh, over the years, it became a lot more clear to me. Uh, not only uh, I began to understand it properly, not just learning, uh, you know, out of my head from the books, but uh, really understanding, but I also understand how essential this understanding is for being able to become a true revolutionary and for seeing a clear path towards a communist future. 
some of these works uh, that are published in Kajoma's latest books are already translated into Russian and they're already published in our magazine in Russian, which is called uh, Contemporary Marxism or Marxism Today. Uh, it's been published in Ukraine, but it's international magazine in Russian language and it's available in different countries and also online. Uh, we already translated such works as Lenin at 150 years, Lenin lives, uh, significance of the Paris Commune of 1871 and its relevance to the world's proletarian revolution and some questions on dialectical materialism. Uh, my interest was also triggered by uh, such uh, works as on the correct handling of contradictions among the people and on practice and contradiction. That probably again comes uh, from my um, that uh, from the fact that m my knowledge of uh, Mao thought is still um, not sufficient. I'm working on it. Uh, but uh, when I thought about contradictions, I remember uh, a friend of mine, it's a retired uh, history teacher from Luhansk, you know, in Ukraine. Uh, his name is Felix Garelik, and uh, he moved to Germany because his children moved to Germany and he lives there, but he's very unhappy. He was uh, going back home to Lugansk at least uh, once a year, but now he can't because there is a war. And um, he uh, he's just a history teacher, but he also tried to think about contradictions, for example, contradictions in the socialist society. And he even developed his own theory that the main contradiction of socialism is contradiction between people's high expectations and the reality that was uh, lacking a bit behind, uh, citing as an example that uh, Khrushchev promised us uh, communism to be built by 1980. Um, I wish he could read all your works, Kajoma, and maybe you have a discussion with you and your comrades. Uh, one of the most important and urgent tasks of the communist movement is the struggle against revisionism. In Russia, we, uh, we have a very difficult situation with it. There's a lot of splits between, uh, uh, within, uh, we have already had uh, about four main communist parties, but now there's also split in one of the most important ones. I think a lot of people, because they lack the knowledge of uh, revolutionary theory of Marxist-Leninist and Mao thought philosophy, um, they are sort of lost. And without defeating our ideological op uh, opponents who pretend to be true revolutionaries and who try to sow confusion among those comrades who are not soundly ideologically prepared, without defeating those uh, revisionists, we cannot successfully march forward. So in, in this sense, uh, such works as Stand for Socialism Against Modern Revisionism and on Trotsky and other slanderers, I think are very important. I think most of the works included into this book, uh, to this book are very important to translate into other languages. Uh, we already made a suggestion uh, to make a compilation uh, of uh, Kajoma's most important works so that we can translate his works, let's say even several volumes of his works in Russian language and publish it in Russian language. Um, maybe we in Eastern Europe should also prepare a compilation of most important work on such issues uh, as uh, how to build a Bolshevik type of party. For example, we could take uh, Kajoma's work about uh, build a Bolshevik type uh, of party and revolutionary mass movement and uh, also publish it together with Ludo Martin's book on um, uh, Party of the Revolution. Uh, because uh, I think we do not know uh, in Eastern Europe sufficiently of uh, the works of our contemporary foreign comrades, and it would uh, help us all, help our ideological and uh, political education, and help us to move uh, towards our mutual goal, and that is not just to explain the world uh, around us, but also to change it. I uh, sincerely would like to thank Kajoma uh, for such an excellent book, and I hope we will read more and more books of him to come this year and next year and many, many years ahead. Thank you very much. Sharp as ever, poignant as always. Thank you, Comrade Irina. Our final review 
of the uh, of the book is uh, will be shared by a former faculty regent of the University of the Philippines where he's also a professor at the Center for International Studies. We invite Professor Ramon or Bomen Guillermo to present his review. Hindi isang tanong kundi isang imperatibo para sa sangkatauhan ang pagkikibaka at pagwawagi laban sa kapitalisang sistema sa ikadalawampu't isa na siglo. Tulad nung nakaraan, sosyalismo o barbarismo pa rin ang pagpipilian. Hawak ng mga imperialistang bansa ang sapat na armas upang pasabugi ng planeta ng ilang daang beses. Nilalaman at winawasak ng walang kabusugang mga korporasyon ang natitirang kalikasan, samantalang ang mayorya ng sangkatauhan ay walang sapat na makakain at servisyong panlipunan sa kabila ng hindi na masukat na kayamanan ng iilang tao. Ang mahalaga ay may pagkakataon pa rin para pumili. Sa larangan ng pilosopiya, ang akto ng pagpili na ito para sa isang tao ay, higit sa lahat, isang usapin ng kanyang piniling paraan ng pag-iral o di pag-iral sa daigdig, isa itong etika. Gayunpaman, masasabing masalimot ang katayuan ng etika sa anyo nitong moralidad sa teoretikal na balangkas ng klasikal na marxismo. Unang-una, nalalaman ng sinumang marxista na ang anumang moralidad ay hindi maihihiwalay sa isang partikular na pangkasaysayang yugto, umiiral na superstruktura at makauuring interes. Mabisa ang kritika ng marxismo laban sa diumanoy universalidad o ipinapangalandakang eternalidad ng mga sistemang etikal. Ngunit sa kabilang banda naman ay malinaw at matingkad ang panwindigang etikal at moral na damdamin ni na Marx at Engels sa lahat ng kanilang mga sulatin kahit pa sa mga pinakatheoretikal sa mga ito. Sa kanyang kritika ng programang Gota, hindi tinanggihan ni Marx ang moralidad o etika per se. Ang tinatanggihan lamang niya ay ang etika ang patuloy na nakakulong at nakapaloob lamang sa abot na ng lipunang burgues. Sa gayoy, ang kailangan ay isang etika ang lumalampas sa mga hangganang ito. Malino na isang bukas na tanong o proyekto ang paglampas na ito sa larangan ng etika sa bahagi ng mga kilusan na ngayon ay nakalubog sa buhay na praktika ng pagpalaya. Dulot ng kasilimuotan ng usaping ito ay lumilitaw ang ilang problematikong pagtingin sa etika kahit sa loob mismo ng mga kilusang revolusyonaryo. Ang una ay ang makaisang panig na kanang pagkakamali na halos eksklusibong itinatanghal ang aspektong moral ng mga akda ni na Marx at Engels. Sa ganitong paraan ay naisasantabi at nasasapawa ng estruktural na pagkusuri ng kapitalismo at ang mismong kritika ng ekonomiyang pampolitika na siyang masasabing pinakamalaki at pinaka-orihinal ng mga ambag ni na Marx at Engels. Kahit minsay mabuti ang intensyon, nahuhulog ang ganitong direksyon sa mga ilusyon na hindi kritikal ng humanistikong universalismo na pinuna ni Jose Maria Sison. Ang ikalawa naman ay ang kaliwang pagkakamali na ganap na ibinabasura ang etikal na konsiderasyon bilang burgues sa esensya at inuturing ang ganitong mga pagbubulay-bulay bilang malaking sagabal o pamigil sa ultrasektarian at superkaliwang mga aksyon na wala di umanong kinikilalang anumang makatao o di makataong mga hangganan. Ang isa pang suliranin ay ang pinagbumulan o batis na pinatawag ni Engels sa anti-during na proletaryong etika o moralidad. <clears throat> Kung ito nga ay may tuturing na pilosopiya, ano ang magiging mga batis nito bilang pilosopiya? Ito ba ay eksklusibong maibabalangkas ng mga akademikong pilosoper batay sa mayaman na tradisyon ng kanluraning, kanluraning pilosopiya? O kahit pa isama na natin ang mga dakilang tradisyong asyano? Sa isang banda, bagamat may karaniwang mapagmaliit at limitadong pagmamahalaga, pagpapahalaga kay Marx, hindi talaga kinikilala ng burgues na akademya ang mga ambag ni na Engels, Lenin, Stalin at Mao sa pilosopiya. Hindi sila itinuturing na katanggap-tanggap kahit bilang paksaman lamang ng kasaysay ng pilosopiya ng ikadalawampung dantaon. Gayunpaman, paminsan-minsan, ay totoong may mga sumisikat na akademikong pilosoper na inaako para sa kanilang mga sarili ang katawagang marxista o kahit mawista pa nga, na nakikipagtunggali sa larangang pilosopikal sa kanilang mga bansa tulad ng Germany, France o USA. 
may tuturing ba sila bilang pangunahing mga inspirasyon sa pagbubuo ng proletaryong etika? Kung interesado man sila rito? At dito rin sa Pilipinas? Hindi sinasabi rito hindi sila maaaring maging mga batis. Ang tanong lang ay kung maaaring maging pangunahing mga batis ang ganitong uri ng pilosopiya. Lalo pang malaking problema ito para sa Pilipinas na hindi may tuturing na isang bansa na nagbibigay ng labis na pagpapahalaga sa pilosopiya o pamimilosopiya. Sa katunayan, ang revolusyonaryong kilusan sa Pilipinas ang isa sa mga pambihirang institusyong panlipunan sa Pilipinas na nagbibigay ng pagpapahalaga sa pag-aaral ng pilosopiya at ng pagpopularisan nito sa hanay ng mga magagawa at magsasaka. Totoo na marami pang kailangang iwasto at paunlarin sa ganitong linya ng gawain, ngunit malinaw na ang pilosopiya ng kilusang revolusyonaryo ay hindi mayahanay sa mga akademikong pilosopiya. Wala itong tuwirang kinalaman sa paglitaw at paglipas ng iba't ibang uso o pinagkakahumalingan sa akademi- akademikong pilosopiya. Hindi ito nakikisabay at tama lamang na hindi ito nakikisabay. May sarili itong panahon, kabuluhan at tunguhin. At sa ganang ito, dapat seryosohin ang panawagan ni Mao na ang mga aktivistang naghahangad mag-aral ng pilosopiya ay kailangan lumubog at makipamuhay sa masa at lumahok sa iba't ibang mga kampanya pakikibaka at tunggalian ng mga uri. Ang materialismo ng kilusan, kung meron itong anumang kabuluhan, ay hindi isang espekulatibong materialismo, kundi isang praktikal at mapagpalayang materialismo sa pakahulugang ibinigay na rito ni Lenin at maging ni Bertolt Brecht. Ang etika ng kilusang revolusyonaryo ay hindi isang abstraktong etika, kundi isang etika na nabubuo at nagkakahugis sa pamamagitan ng revolusyonaryong praktika. Malino sa mga sulatin ni JMS hinggil sa pilosopiya, ang panawagan para sa pagsasabuhay, pagpapayaman at pagpapaunlad ng proletaryong etika o moralidad, sa gitna ng kasalukuyang mga pakikibaka at maging ng sosyalistang moralidad sa panahon naman ng pagtatayo ng sosyalismo sa hinaharap. Tampok ang temang ito higit sa lahat sa kanyang pagpapahalaga sa kategorya ng kontradiksyong di antagonistiko na bagamat unang sumulpot sa mga pilosopong Soviet noong 1930s, ay bukod tanging binigyan ng higit na wastong elaborasyon ni Mao. Sa kabilang banda, tipikal na pananaw mula sa akademikong pilosopiya ang mapagmaliit at mapagkutya na pagpapasaring ni Adorno sa kategoryang ito, sa isang sulatin niya, bilang halimbawa ng mapagpanggap na katalinuhan ng mga Chinese. Kahit pabunga ito ng mayaman na karnasan, ng pagredebolusyon ng daan-daang milyong tao na nagkataon lamang ay hindi mga Europeo. Sa katunayan kung mayroon mga akda ni Mao na kumakatawan sa praktikal na pilosopiya na masasabing nagkaroon ng malalim na epekto sa praktika ng mga mawisa sa Pilipinas, itong akdang hinggil sa wastong paghawak ng mga kontradiksyon sa hanay ng mamamayan. Mahalagang interview kay JMS kung saan nabigay siya ng pagusuri at komentaryo sa sanaysay na ito ni Mao. Lumaganap ang sanaysay na ito ni Mao sa internasyonal na antas bilang bahagi ng maliit na koleksyong binansagang limang sanaysay hinggil sa pilosopiya na naglalaman din sa mga bantog na sanaysay na hinggil sa praktika at hinggil sa kontradiksyon. Sinangayunan ni JMS ang palagay ni Mao na sa maraming pagkakataon ay maaaring mangibabaw ang mga di-antagonistikong paraan ng pagresolba sa mga kontradiksyon sa hanin ng mamayan tulad ng diskusyon, pangangatwiran, panghihikayat at edukasyon. Kailangang tamang panghawakan ng mga kontradiksyon sa lipunan upang maiwasan ng mga pagkakamali at anumang kalabisan. Kung sakaling mangyari, dapat maiwaso agad ang mga ganitong uri ng pagkakamali at malinis ang mga pangalan ng mga naakusahan. Kasama na sa pagwawastong ito ang pagpuna at pagpuna sa sarili upang maiwasan hanggat maari ang pag-uulit ng ganitong mga pagkakamali. Dagdag pa, ang sino mang pinaghihinalaan na nagsasagawa ng mga kriminal na aktibidad sa lipunang sosyalista ay dapat dumaan sa mga karampatang legal na proseso na mahigpit na nakabatay sa ebidensya. Sinalungguhitan ni Dini JMS na kailangan matuto sa pagkakamali ni Stalin ng pagdeklara ng pagpawi ng mga uri sa USSR noong 1936 na humantong sa mga pagkakamali sa pamamaraan ng paghawak ng mga antagonistiko at di-antagonistikong mga kontradiksyon sa loob ng lipunang Soviet. Makikita sa mga usaping ito na may malalim na kinalaman ng kategorya ng di-antagonistikong kontradiksyon sa pagbubuo ng proletaryong etika ng pakikitungo, 
pakikipagkaisa at pakikitunggali sa isang makauring lipunan. Sa ganang ito, interesante ang palagay ni JMS sa kanyang panawagan para sa dialogo sa pagitan ng mga sistemang etikal na kristyano, burgues liberal at proletaryado na maaaring may mga bahagi itong komon na pwedeng maging batayan ng naturang dialogo. Gayun din, nakakaintriga ang kanyang palagay, katulad din ng palagay ni Engels, na bagamat walang maangkin na eternalidad ang tatlong sistemang ito, maaaring nagtataglay ang proletaryong moralidad ng pinakamaraming elemento na pangmatagalan, kung hindi man permanente. Mababatid na humahalaw ang proletaryong etika sa pakahulugan ni JMS sa mayayamang mga aral kapwa ng mga tagumpay at pagkabigo ng mga nakaraang karnasang revolusyonaryo sa dating USSR, China, Vietnam, Indonesia, Cuba at ng iba pang mga positibong kilusan sa daigdig. Malinaw na hindi magkasalungat ang siyensya ng ekonomiyang pampolitika at ang proletaryadong etika. May pinagbabatay ang etika ang kritika ng ekonomiyang pampolitika at nakabatay din ang proletaryong etika sa ekonomiyang pampolitika. Hindi pagbabalat bunga lamang ang binagit ni Engels na paglitaw ng proletaryong moralidad ng kinabukasan. Gayunpaman, sumisibol ang etikang proletaryado sa gitna ng tunggalian ng mga uri. Hindi ito bunga lamang ng revolusyon sa katapusan nito, kundi namumuo at nagkakahugis sa gitna at sa proseso ng pagre-revolusyon mismo. Wow, that was uh, puro Tagalog. Thank you, Professor uh, Guillermo. Um, isang bagsak. Okay, here we go again. One, two, three. Okay, wait a minute. You didn't join. One more time. One, two, three. Okay. Um, we discovered that uh, um, you cannot post comments uh, on YouTube for questions. So if you would still like to uh, post a question uh, and you're on YouTube, please send an email to jmsbooklaunch at gmail.com. So paulit. Um, I hope you can read this, jmsbooklaunch at gmail.com. Um, before going to our much-awaited uh, uh, open forum, we have for you an interpretative dance of the song Levantata y Mira by Victor Hara, uh, performed by the Road Lelis or Red Lilies, accompanied uh, on piano by 11-year-old Ilian Taguba.
Thank you, Ilian Thank you. and the Rodi Lelis uh, for a beautiful and heartwarming performance. Also, so much history lies behind this piece. Uh, Victor Jara was a Chilean poet, singer, composer. Uh, he was a political activist, tortured and killed during the dictatorship of Chilean President Augusto Pinochet, a dictatorship fully enabled by United States imperialism all throughout those dark years. And uh, this song is one of Jara's most famous musical compositions, Levantante e Mira, uh, La Montana, or Rise Up and Look at the Mountain, or as we Filipinos know it, Tumindig ka. At this point, uh, Chico, we now open the floor to a conversation with Professor Jose Maria Sison himself. Um, so may we request all to raise and respond to the many questions uh, you have prepared. So, um, and please make them straight to the point so we can devote more time to the Q&A. Um, there are actually questions that have been sent to us. So I, I have the honor to read the first one. Uh, Professor Joma, are you ready? Okay, yes. first question. Kajoma, ready? What are your top three books for readings that you uh, that you would uh, recommend for young or new activists? Three the question only. is difficult, but too many books to choose okay. from. But anyway, I would try to give you uh, the most um, necessary readings one has to make at the beginning. So uh, first, you have the Communist Manifesto. Then uh, second, uh, uh, let's have something from Lenin, what is to be done. And then uh, from Mao, uh, let's have correct handling of contradictions among the people. And that gives us an opening to, you know, the great proletarian cultural revolution. Wow. Chico, yes. fire Yes, there are more questions. Um, Three lang din, ha? What slogans uh, best capture the gist or spirit of MLM philosophy? Well, well I would say um, the first slogan would be divide one into two. Do not be imp uh, do not be so much uh, be so much awed by something whole. Huh? Um, uh, you you uh, there's nothing you cannot analyze, no? So. Divide one into two. That's actually uh, a simple expression of uh, co uh, uh, contradiction no? and the study of contradiction. Then um, uh, next is uh, uh, to rebel is justified. Uh, so, you know, that covers a lot of ground. No? But, but I mean, uh, um, uh, I, I, I obviously this slogan is within the frame of the class struggle, no? and then dare to struggle and dare to win. So you have the, you got three slogans. The question is also difficult because there's so many slogans uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that uh, you would miss, like workers of the world unite and uh, oppressed uh, uh, peoples and nations unite, no. So anyway, uh, you've got, uh, you've got uh, four. <laughs> You're asking only for the three, for three slogans. <laughs> okay, uh, Professor Cison, third question. Did philosophy have a role in bolstering or fanning revisionism in contemporary China and the former USSR? Uh, naturally, um, uh, bourgeois ideology uh, taking the form of uh, philosophy um, uh, was uh, promoted by the uh, revisionists in both the Soviet Union and uh, China. And um, you see, uh, uh, by the law of the contradiction, you know, when you stand, of in, for instance, for uh, uh, materialist, Marxist materialist philosophy, you uh, consider um, the contradiction between materialism and idealism, and uh, anyone can flip, no? Uh, where, whereas uh, you have to understand both sides and then take sides, 
uh, with, uh, let's say, the materials position. But uh, if you are uh, the weakling sort of thinker, oh, there's some merit in the, uh, on the other side, and then you keep on enlarging that. And then in society, you see, after um, the revo socialist revolution begins, uh, don't think that uh, the cultural influence of the old society does not continue. Uh, you know, there are sayings and parables that come from the old society. There are the old customs, old ideas and old habits. No? And um, those, um, um, those can um, influence you. Yeah? And then uh, I'll cite my, and then, you know, the, the international bourgeoisie keeps on uh, as, uh, sending out um, uh, influences from the outside, no? Uh, but, uh, let's say uh, the voice of freedom, the voice of Europe, no? Uh, run by the US or, you know, many concrete things. Uh, in the, I'll, I'll go anecdotal, no? Uh, you see, uh, there are children of the upper middle class um, um, intellectuals or some small property owners, no? Uh, you know, um, they were not classified as enemies. As there was no hindrance to, you know, the study uh, uh, of uh, the children in school. But then, you know, there is the influence of the family. Um, or let's say, they, let's take the children of landlords uh, who were able to, uh, uh, who, who, were, who have been uh, able to continue in the new society. They'll say, tell the children, oh, this area used to be ours, no? Oh, that company used to be ours, no? We used to own 90% of the stocks in that company. So, um, and then, uh, um, you know, uh, um, uh, officials uh, of uh, the Chinese society travel. And, of course, there are uh, 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 foreign uh, embassies and uh, uh, visitors. And then... Uh, special stores, special stores uh, are open for foreigners huh? uh, to suit their uh, um, foreign um, uh, uh, foreign taste and or international um, um, uh, likings for certain things. So I will be approached. Uh, I would be approached by a, a comrade, a Chinese comrade. Will you buy? Because, you know, ordinary Chinese uh, uh, people uh, cannot buy from those foreign uh, stores. So I would be asked, can you buy uh, uh, this thing for me? And, you know, uh, as a foreigner, I would go, do a good turn for the friend. Or let us say um, there are uh, comrades who... Uh, go on delegations to foreign conferences, you know. After the conferences, they go shopping, you know, and uh, uh, then they, they, got, they get inf uh, influenced by the level of... Um, um, uh, the level of... Uh, 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 things, huh? Uh, there are things not readily available in a uh, socialist society. Yeah, the capitalist society is ahead no? in producing, you know, this uh, uh, high-tech products, you know. Uh, it could be, say, in the, 19, um, <laughs> in the 1950s, cameras would be a, good, a big deal, no? So uh, the country bumpkins of the East Germany would be so impressed, no? They, they become impressed with the West having those cameras. Then you have the... Uh, video recorders, and then uh, uh, so many other things. Uh, um, uh, because uh, the socialist society has not reached the stage of producing this new, this new things, uh, um, uh, these electronic products, so, uh, their mind become influenced. So it's, uh, uh, it's not true that uh, the situation is very bad in the uh, imperialist countries. Uh, they have new things that we do not have, no? So that sort of thing. And then, the, and then the wise guys, the revisionists who rise up in the um, 
um, bureaucracy and in the in the university who start suggesting oh let's put up an institute of uh, North American uh, studies or US and Canadian studies yeah so under the guise of uh, you know uh, knowing more about the world no um, and of course with emphasis on the West uh, uh, so you know uh, Studying under the auspices of the Institute of Marxism Leninism would become uh, would look antiquated, no? Mm -hmm. uh, the new thing eh, that is attractive to the students uh, would be the Institute of uh, um, uh, North American Studies, and you know students would flood into the uh, uh, subjects into the classrooms uh, uh, of of this institute. Also, that's how uh, that that's how a socialist society can be penetrated. But you know, there, there can be a good thing that will arise from what has already happened with the uh, Soviet Union and uh, breaking up, and um, uh, China become capitalist uh, like this, like uh, Russia. Um, uh, what is good is that the increase of imperialist powers uh, make the crisis of the world capitalist system worse. And so in the in the forthcoming rounds of class struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, um, there will be bigger opportunities, uh, wider opportunities for the proletariat to advance the socialist revolution. So uh, um, that's how philosophy um, can be introduced forthrightly uh, in its bourgeois form. Um, be it idealist or subjectivist, and um, um, but uh, there are uh, helping. There, there are circumstances that help, no, um, uh, uh, to discredit, no, uh, what may be considered already as catechism, no, <laughs> taught in the Marxist classes, no. So they think, oh, huh? uh, this is. Uh, uh, this is um, this is something new, yeah? and because uh, the, uh, the 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 Western imperialist powers are clever at ideological work, no? They have the think tanks, they have the philosophy departments, and they churn out a lot of uh, um, um, uh, ideologies or philosophies that are uh, that run counter to Marxism Leninism. You just imagine, eh? you have the Austrian school, the Frankfurt school, and uh, all those uh, 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 all those posterior philosophies from Paris, and then you have the so-called um, analytic philosophy or uh, empiricism in uh, in British uh, uh, in the United Kingdom. You have the school of uh, uh, Chicago, and so on. So uh, the imperialists take seriously ideological struggle and they put forward their philosophies and uh, bring them yeah, uh, to the socialist countries in order to subvert yeah, the, um, uh, what should be the material, dialectical materialist and socialist thinking in the, the socialist countries. Thank you, Professor Season, for that uh, uh, answer. Uh, another uh, question was, uh, why is it that uh, red political power still exists in the Philippines? Can you elaborate on that, please? Well, red political power still exists in the Philippines. And uh, thanks to the teaching of Mao, uh, that the countryside provides not only the physical terrain, but the social terrain eh, for uh, a protracted people's war. And, uh, you know, uh, you can have a wide uh, agriculture in the West, you know, large tracts of land operated by uh, uh, rich farmers as well as uh, uh, big uh, agri-corporations, no? You don't have the social terrain there for protracted people so now, right now. When uh, agriculture is, uh, when, when the rural population is reduced to 2% to but in a semi-colonial country like China before 1949, and the Philippines right now, also a semi-feudal country, you have the, the, the most numerous class, uh, uh, the peasantry in the countryside, that provides you the social terrain. No? 
That is the class that will keep blind and deaf the enemy looking for the NPA, and that is the class that will um, uh, nor that will nurture, protect, and shield the uh, NPA from uh, uh, enemy attacks. So that's how the uh, how the the, the uh, protected people's war uh, has gone on, and the uh, um, NPA has continued to exist. And red political power to mean eh, having the revolutionary mass base of revolutionary mass organizations and the local organs of political power, eh, they are there. And so uh, I have, I always have a big laugh when you know these idiots like Duterte, Lorenzana, uh, down to paid hacks like Tiglau and so on. No? And they said, oh, you've been fighting for more than 50 years, but you have not taken over Manila, uh, Manila yet. No, no, you're crazy. Uh, the red political power is being built in the countryside. The, pe the local organs of political power constitute a new state, <clears throat> a new government of the workers and peasants against the Manila-based government of uh, big compradors and landlords, no? So that's the beauty of protracted people's war. You, uh, without taking over yet uh, uh, the cities because you don't have the armed strength to do it, you can build uh, the people's government in the countryside. That's the beauty of it. And um, right now, uh, modesty aside, the armed revolutionary movement in the Philippines is now number one in the world, no? It, it has developed the revolutionary forces and revolutionary movement, mass movement in the countryside comprehensively, uh, despite what? Despite the strategic setbacks suffered by the working class because of uh, modern revisionism. And despite already four decades eh, of neoliberalism, eh, abusing the proletariat and yet extending the life of capitalism and providing you know consumer products by eh, resorting to loose uh, loose credit no uh, loose credit for building uh, you know uh, for making the big constructions private and public and then uh, uh, that is to provide the cash flow for supporting the exchange of uh, raw materials from the underdeveloped countries and the manufacturers. And, but uh, uh, in, in a deep way, the Philippine economy has become rotten that way. And uh, uh, so, um, uh, but now the problem for the world capital system is really the public debt bubble uh, of uh, all countries. Um, so uh, that is about to explode. And the rottenness of the Philippine economy is ensured by neoliberalism and, of course, by the bureaucratic corruption and military overspending by the Duterte regime. So thanks to them, eh, um, thanks to them, there is a recrudescence of the Marcos fascist dictatorship, which is a, the manifestation of a system uh, that is going to part, no? that is a system that is uh, decomposing. So uh, Duterte, uh, you have to thank Duterte for being the chief recruiter eh, for the revolutionary movement. He took the place of Marcos. You know? Uh, Marcos, you know, the revolutionary movement advanced rapidly with the, with the son of Agan Marcos uh, eh, uh, thought it could suppress, the, to suppress it. Now, you have another crazy guy, this Duterte, wanting to suppress the revolutionary movement. Uh, but uh, let us see eh, how he can invent uh, claims that he has is uh, succeeding at his uh, um, at his uh, puppet ways of uh, as, uh, of, of uh, trying to please his imperialist uh, and reactionary masters. Next question, uh, Kajoma. How can something like philosophy be in any way related to a politically charged idea like Marxism, Leninism, Maoism? In the history of mankind, there's such a, a long period, um, thousands, 
it, uh, you consider a slave society where uh, you saw you uh, in the western philosoph philosophical tradition you have uh, um, uh, plato aristotle and then you, you know you have the suppression of the uh, rudimentary materialist philosophers because you know the ruling class the slave owners favor eh, the idealism of plato eh? and then came the feudal uh, period eh? Where in the uh, um, i i choose the western uh, european tradition because that's where you have the sequence of uh, uh, social developments uh, um, uh, and social circumstances and there with uh, certain philosophies. So another kind of idealism uh, or, or a, a variant, no? you have the absolute idea of Plato, which was uh, regnant in, slave, uh, in Greek society and in Rome, starting from the fourth century, uh, you have the ascendance of, uh, of Christianity with its uh, objective idealism. Um, and uh, this kind of uh, um, philosophy uh, ascribing to God everything, uh, you know, dismissing, uh, sweepingly dismissing everything else as the creation of God, you know, serves the, the, the feudal aristocracy. So every philosophy that is dominant uh, serves the ruling class. Um, and um, th this, uh, um, and you know, the Christianity um, uh, availed of uh, only the uh, objective idealist or uh, type of uh, philosophy from uh, slave society. Huh? So you have, uh, uh, Christian philosophers like Saint Augustine using uh, Plato, Aristotle, and then you have uh, Saint Aquinas uh, later on using um, using uh, Aristotle. No? So you know there is a kinship between the slave masters and uh, the feudal aristocracy in that they um, they exploit a lot of people or put to work on the land. No, but came the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie rose up. And um, um, uh, very much the bourgeoisie, uh, at first with the development of handicrafts and manufacturing, you know, you appear to be very, you know, very much uh, responsible for what they create, no? Without having to pray huh, to the God, no? And then came, uh, there, then in the field of science, um, uh, there would be great advances. Uh, and um, uh, uh, mechanical physics uh, of uh, mechanics of uh, uh, Newton would arise. And then among philosophers who look over the entire society, uh, they would make a shift from, uh, human, uh, from divinism to humanism. And before you know it, you reach, uh, before you know it in my account, uh, I bring you right away, yeah, to the 18th century of the Enlightenment, no? <laughs> and and uh, this time, uh, you know, the sovereign will is no longer ascribed eh, uh, to uh, uh, whoever is the monarch and someone above, eh, a supreme being above the monarch. Uh, the will of the people now becomes the... Um, um, the, the, the a uh, revolving point for uh, the people to be able to uh, to move forward. And so you have the concept of the people's sovereignty and you have the principle of liberal democracy coming up. So that's the first, that's the first big um, political bridge on, on the notion that the uh, social order is preordained uh, uh, by, uh, uh, by God. Uh? And um, and uh, it is people who create, who make history. That's the beginning. The, you have to give credit to the liberal democrats, no? uh, ascribing to the people. No? And you know, you know the bourgeoisie uh, advance, uh, raising the flag of the, uh, uh, raising the rags of the poor, no? uh, the poor peasants and plebeians as their flag. No? Um, so anyway, uh, came the uh, came the industrial revolution. In the uh, uh, 
19th century and you have Marx and Engels huh, within the first half of the 19th century. Uh, so a further uh, advance on, uh, on realistic and practical thinking eh, among scholars and people. And you know, uh, Marx and Engels availed of uh, the, uh, the advances um, uh, made by idealist philosophy. That's how they, they got to know Hegel and turned him upside down, turned it upside down to, uh, to put uh, uh, on a materialist basis the uh, concept of dialectics uh, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, the connection between philosophy and uh, uh, politics in, uh, in Marxism, Leninism is maintained by the previous ruling classes, by the previous societies. Um, uh, the overarching idea is the absolute idea or the God. No? Uh, now, uh, for the first time down on earth, uh, you have the uh, you have the a, a new class looking over the entire universe and the entire society, uh, um, and then in, uh, interpreting interpreting uh, uh, the universe and uh, human society. And not only interpreting, eh, as Marx pointed out, eh, um, she, uh, uh, you have the proletariat uh, with its core of philosophers and uh, professional revolutionaries, as Lenin would uh, point out, uh, uh, determined eh, to change the world. Uh, the point is to change the world. That's the that's the um, uh, teaching of Marx. Um, so uh, philosophy is something uh, you cannot do away with in making a revolution. So uh, as a matter of fact, it is the first component of the three basic components of Marxism, uh, which are philosophy, political economy, and social science. Thank you uh, for that elaboration, uh, Professor uh, Sison. Um, are you still okay? <laughs> okay. Are you still okay? Hmm? Are you still okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, from that historical perspective, we go back to the uh, more contemporary time. And there's a question of what is, uh, in your opinion, the effect of non-inclusion of Maoism in some struggles like Cuba? Uh, the DPRK uh, and others? Well, uh, if the big uh, uh, socialist states uh, have gone capitalist and uh, um, and uh, you, you can uh, see that uh, they fell short of the philosophy, <laughs> the political economy uh, and social science demanded by uh, scientific socialism, no, uh, you know, and they, they, this uh, earlier socialist societies became vulnerable to subversion by modern revisionism. Now, uh, uh, there are two ways of describing this smaller scale countries that avow eh, to be socialist or that carry the socialist cause. Eh? Uh, let's give them the benefit of a doubt, no. Um, uh, you know, they are better off uh, than the former big brothers because, you know, they, they continue to exist. No? So in their own ways, they have been able to, uh, to prevent the revisionist subversion that amounts to bringing down the, uh, that results in bringing down uh, their states, uh, which uh, have uh, certain socialist features, like, you know, uh, the acclamation of the proletariat as the leading class, uh, you know, public ownership of the means of production, or at least uh, a principal means of production. No? Uh, and then there are certain elements, you know, in the uh, in this uh, uh, compendium of Maoist uh, ideas. They they have um, uh, there are certain elements. Uh, for instance, DPRK is very pronounced in saying, oh, we have the philosophy of Juche. We have the, uh, uh, Juche is self-reliance. That's very Maoist, even if they don't say it's, uh, it comes from Mao. 
for indeed it can come uh, only from the people that are self-reliant. Uh, but as idea, well, at least we can say there is a similarity between Maoism and Kim Il-sung's idea of Juche. Uh, and then uh, also the case of Cuba, uh, without uh, saying the same thing, like uh, self-reliance uh, decides everything. Yeah? Um, you have seen that um, um, in so many ways, in accordance with so many ideas that amount to, you know, uh, um, keeping a self-reliant uh, uh, political and economic system, you have a country as so small, huh? uh, right at the uh, um, in 90, only 90 miles away from the U.S. Huh? It, it survived. So there must be something good there huh? to, to see. And um, so I don't have to cover the others. There are too many of them. No, um, <laughs> Some say Vietnam is... Uh, another uh, good remnant of the old uh, uh, system of socialist states. No? But um, uh, some say, well, uh, uh, when, they, when they won in 1975, they were in big trouble because the Soviet Union was already, uh, uh, was already deteriorating. The Soviet economy was deteriorating. And then they have to resort to the doimoi, uh, 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 system like uh, uh, China has done. Uh, uh, they adopted certain reforms allowing more private uh, uh, entrepreneurs to operate in the economy. So uh, you have to study these countries one by one. The point is they stay on. In so far as they can stay on, there is some strength for them to stay on because uh, the imperialists do not love them anyway uh, completely, although uh, the imperialists may like certain uh, developments uh, and they try to subvert these countries. But um, you see the Philippine, uh, the Philippine Revolution um, may be credited with being able to withstand no? uh, the strategic setbacks of the socialist cause and the uh, uh, imposition of neoliberalism, which has been running for uh, more than four decades. So, you know, the, having a, 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 an ongoing, growing revolutionary movement in the Philippines is quite an achievement. That's why it's now being targeted by US imperialism. And they're using a butcher Duterte. You know, uh, Duterte was a, uh, was a chosen puppet uh, to, do this, uh, um, to do this campaign, uh, to destroy the movement by mass killing and uh, all sorts of barbarities in a dirty war. Uh, because the the U.S. wants to complete the process of destroying the world um, proletarian revolution, all the uh, especially the outstanding remnants. The other outstanding remnant is uh, the Maoist-led uh, uh, People's War in the, in India, and that has a, a good future if the if the Indian Maoists do their uh, do their fighting well. Uh, they have the scale of building large armies like in the Soviet Union and uh, in, um, in, in uh, uh, China. No? The Philippines, yes. you, know, you know, this is the, the, this is what is wonderful about the Philippine Revolution. No? You see, uh, the Philippines consists of, a, um, uh, art of uh, so many islands, but of course we have already de demystified. No? Uh, there's thousands of islands, as uh, you know, you say, uh, 11 of those islands uh, carry 94% of the population. So don't be, uh, don't be confused by the islands, unless the Chinese imperialism is trying to grab some of them. No, um, so <laughs> uh, you, uh, we, we have been able. Oh, you know, there is that song, eh? it's very good. No, uh, uh, turning so many islands into a um, na buo, no? a, a whole fortress. But you know, the Filipinos have always been outstanding, have been outstanding in making revolution in, in the modern world. No? Um, the Philippines was the first uh, to, uh, um, to wage uh, successfully uh, the old democratic revolution Spanish, uh, against Spanish colonialism. And the first to fight uh, a Western imperialist power, the United States. 
but of course the the Vietnamese have gone ahead uh, in being able to inflict uh, uh, the first defeat on that monster uh, U.S. imperialism. So uh, the Filipino revolutionaries have a historical uh, record that is very heroic, and um, and they know the revolutionary forces know how to preserve themselves and grow strength. Uh, uh, it's just right, it's just right that uh, in certain regions, uh, uh, right down in the strategic stage of the strategic uh, defensive, you have squads and platoons and sometimes companies inflicting thousands of wounds on the, on the enemy. Huh? And uh, before you know it, there shall be companies and battalions uh, to carry out the strategic stalemate. Uh, and eventually you have the battalions and regiments that will uh, uh, more speedily uh, uh, take, uh, carry out the nationwide uh, uh, seizure of power in a general offensive. Great. Okay, I think I have the last question here. Uh, you still have a question, Chico, unless there are more questions. I think this would be the last one from our audience. So, Kajoma, are you ready for this? Yes, uh, China is uh, by the definition of Lenin. Of, uh, uh, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> okay, this is, I'm just going to read it. How should we deal with Chinese imperialism and how are you able to reconcile current China with uh, Mao Zedong's original vision? Uh, well, uh, by the definition of modern imperialism by uh, Lenin, uh, China has all the characteristics, you know. So um, the only difference there from the um, imperialist powers in the time of Lenin is that you have a combination of state monopoly capitalism and uh, uh, private monopoly capitalism. They work together in the Chinese example of uh, modern imperialism. So let us review the five characteristics. Monopoly capitalism is in uh, it dominates Chinese society, Chinese economy and society. Then you have the integration of um, bank capital and industrial capital. China can, you know, invest so fast because, you know, uh, the cousins, the brothers and cousins on both sides of the two tiered economy eh, help each other out with loans, eh? oftentimes uh, bad loans. Uh, you know, China is now sitting on a lot a mountain of blood, bad loans. But uh, at any rate, the, the Chinese, these Chinese capitalists have been able to grow uh, an industrial economy, contrary before to the notion that uh, China will be reduced to a, 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 a big, big comprador economy with the use of these uh, low-tech uh, uh, sweatshop operations. Then um, you have... Uh, the export of surplus capital. And the, the China was very clever at using the surplus, uh, the surplus from the trade with the US. Uh, the, the, that surplus in Chinese banks were not entirely Chinese, but you know, they were able to, uh, they have been able to use it for lending to so many countries as yeah, up to the, you know, this um, um, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. No? Uh, then you have this uh, China in combination uh, with other imperialist powers. Uh, um, the, uh, China has been trying hard to retain its, uh, its partnership with the U.S., but the U.S. Uh, um, uh, has already regarded China as its chief uh, uh, political rival and economic competitor. So China is now compelled to uh, rely more on its combination with uh, with Russia, uh, but uh, someday Russia can complain because the China is moving into the former Soviet republics like Kazakhstan and so on. And um, uh, this business, uh, this loan, this uh, loan imperialism, you know, uh, lending uh, lending surplus capital involves uh, uh, gouging terms. No, uh, the terms uh, are so onerous. Huh? So many countries have been complaining. Um, uh, and, and the U.S. is out to sabotage you know, the, uh, the expansion of Chinese capital. And then, and you come to the fifth feature, um, 
in the third picture, um, uh, well, um, long ago, since the time of uh, since the time of Lenin, eh, uh, the world was already completely covered eh, by global capitalism. Now, what is worse now is there are too many, too, too big imperialist powers in addition to the traditional to the traditional ones in G7 uh, makes the world uh, explosive. No? So, and, um, and in our region, uh, in the first case of outright aggression, no? uh, China has been claiming uh, the exclusive uh, uh, economic zone and uh, extended continental shelf of the Philippines. Well, uh, China, um, uh, the uh, post-Mao China can be seen, can be understood most clearly by considering what was done by uh, uh, 1978. I mean, not so many people uh, noticed that as early as 1976, um, the Deng Xiaoping was already able to make a coup d'etat against the proletariat. And it, it was the coup d'etat was done in a com uh, with the combination of the uh, rightist of Deng and the and the and the centrist. But by 1978, eh, Mao was completely negated completely because the GPCR, eh, the the crown jewel eh, of uh, uh, Maoist ideology, uh, and its. Uh, practical application in the GPCR um, was judged to be a complete catastrophe. And, and Deng Xiaoping, uh, together with the centrists, were able to push, uh, um, to push uh, the concept of modernization, uh, which uh, means uh, adapting, adapting, uh, uh, bourgeois econo economic reforms, capitalist economic reforms, up to allowing uh, the foreign investors to come in in order to, you know, accelerate modernization of the Chinese economy and opening up to the U.S. and uh, the world capitalist system. So, um, and proletarian internationalism has been dismissed as uh, something very narrow. And uh, it, 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 the, the wide thing is uh, uh, integration in the world capitalist system. So China has been definitely um, um, developing as a capitalist country uh, since 19, uh, 1970 with the dismantling. Eh? You know, uh, there was a dismantling of the commune system, the rural, um, um, the publicly owned, uh, rural industries were privatized and the, um, uh, the former big capitalists of China were given, uh, were paid uh, uh, one more time what was what, uh, what had been paid for before and uh, the war bonds uh, and they were, they were given access uh, they were given access to the state banks so Deng Xiaoping was imitating uh, the capitalist of uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai. Um, I, I'm sorry, Singapore rather. Um, the, uh, um, Deng Xiaoping learned a lot. Uh, the, um, um, you see, um, as early as uh, uh, 1957, when China was, try was trying to move forward and uh, adapt the Great Leap Forward, uh, the uh, the capitalists of China um, in this in the state private corporations was collecting twenty five percent of uh, of profits from corporations. That was a great deal, and Mao wanted to do to to do away with that. Uh, but then uh, revisionists like Liu Xiaoqi, Deng Xiaoping. Uh, the Chen Yun and so and others uh, in the Central Committee, especially Peng Tai uh, they didn't like this, and they were already following um, the Soviet example of modern revisionism. 
And uh, so Mao really had a difficult time uh, up to 1976. Um, well, the current uh, China now is anti-Mao, even if they have the face of Mao at Tiananmen or on every Chinese uh, uh, money bill. Huh? Huh? They are using, uh, <laughs> you know, this is, this is how great people are treated, no? Uh, uh, the... Um, uh, Claro, I'll give you an example, local example. No? Claro Mayo Recto was, uh, uh, was a product of the Ateneo. He was not just summa cum laude. He was maxima cum laude. Uh, near perfect score, like Rizal. And they're the only two uh, graduates of Ateneo who are considered maxima cum laude. When in uh, Recto was attacking U.S. imperialism. The American Jesuits at the Ateneo hated him uh, like hell. No? But when he died, eh, he would be honored. No? In the, at least the, there were ceremonies. That is Mao. Eh? Uh, he's, a gr he's great in Chinese history, but the revisionists and, I mean, and uh, the capitalist voters uh, would uh, uh, only give a lip service in order to advance their... Uh, their, their, their policies. Uh, so that's the, that's the situation. Um, the, there is something hypocritical about Chinese monopoly capitalism. No? Uh, it says it is socialism with the Chinese characteristics, uh, but just a lot of bull, no? uh, nationalist bull. Okay. Thank you so much for your insights and time, Professor Season. Uh, for questions we cannot accommodate today, uh, please send them to uh, jmsbooklaunch at gmail.com. That's jmsbooklaunch at gmail.com. And we will respond to them as soon as possible. And of course, uh, we invite all to get your copies of the book online from Apple Books, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and Kobo, or in print at La Solidaridad and popular bookstores in Manila. And um, thank you all for participating in our conversation with the author. Thank you so much to our audience here on Zoom and on uh, YouTube, on Facebook, everywhere. Um, and remember, the power of MLM is that it is a philosophy that's put into action through the struggle to free the working class from oppression. And um, for our closing, let us now listen to Filipino musician and composer Danny Fabella, who will offer a performance of his song titled Busabos ng Puhunan or Slaves of Capital or Those Enslaved by Capital. Sa inyo ay gawin Na dapat wasakin at dapat
for this song about the working class, Danny Fabella. Um, can we, um, well, uh, Kajoma, Professor Joma, are you still with us? May we have a quick last word from you before we, uh, before we end? Meron pang ano, final word. Uh, Sarah and uh, Chico for hosting uh, this uh, webinar and um, of course I thank all of our listeners um, I hope that uh, uh, they've been able to get uh, more information and more ideas uh, about our subject matter than uh, before okay Thank you so much. Um, and last but not the least, to close our book launch today with an inspirational message, let us hear from the chairperson of the National Labor Center, Kilusang Mayo Uno, or May 1st Movement in the Philippines, Ka Elmer Kabong Labog. Yeah, uh, magandang gabi po sa inyo lahat. Uh, I wish to express warm uh, solidarity greetings to uh, Professor Joma Sison. You're so full of life. You are so energetic. And I think uh, the uh, session has, should have been extended more uh, to accommodate more of the questions. Uh, also, I'd like to thank all of you who took time to participate in the launching of the second book of the Season Reader series on the philosophy of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. We have pointed out the relevance of having this series, especially for workers and all those fighting for genuine national and social liberation. The volume on philosophy lays the basic foundation for the study and application in other fields such as political economy and the revolutionary struggle towards scientific socialism. The Marxist materialist dialectic is a weapon of the working class and it must serve all workers and the oppressed. Comrade Season has given us this indispensable weapon. What really matters now is our ability to practically apply our wealth of MLM fundamentals to our daily lives and struggles. For us workers and revolutionaries, the work, the Marxist tool of SICA, or social investigation and class analysis, has been of universal importance and an indispensable tool at, as it has guided us so much in our task to arouse, mobilize, and organize the masses. In fact, for a long time now, SI alone has been a byword for concrete analysis of concrete conditions. We can enrich the aforesaid indispensable tool by perhaps severing 
The important suggested powerful reading materials by Professor Jose Maria Season, which are as follows. One, the Communist Manifesto. Second, what is to be done. And on the correct, on the third, and the correct handling of contradiction. Uh, selections which are also all my uh, favorites. And so, as Professor Ramon Guillermo, Ramon Guillermo aptly puts it, Integration with the masses is an important element of every movement. In the Filipino workers' lingo, gawaing masa and not gawaing mesa. The, the former means integrating and living with the masses. The, la, the latter, working most of the time in your office desk. To quote Mao, open quote, communists are like seeds and the people are like the soil. Wherever we go, we must unite with the people, take root, and blossom among them. End of quote. So, uh, lessons from the working class struggles in the history of Paris Commune, of the Paris Commune, and especially the Great October Revolution, are significant cornerstones of the proletarian revolution and are inspirations to our continuing struggle. The 1917 Bolshevik revolution virtually changed the face of the earth the great liberations that followed in china latin america and vietnam are likewise golden historical events worth drawing lessons from in our present struggles we are glad that notwithstanding the limitations and restrictions brought about by the pandemic and continuing persecution against jose maria season by the u.s china duterte regime we are still able to make these loans a success. Filipino workers, Professor Joma, are eagerly awaiting for the copies of the series. Although I've heard that uh, it's already available in various uh, bookstores here, uh, uh, I, I believe that workers in general should have basic knowledge of LM MLM. This is their theory. This is their practice. This is their very life. For those having difficulty in study, we can have study guides and other teaching aids. This series is definitely of great significance. I am elated to learn from Com Comrade Irina Malenko, I hope I got her name correctly, uh, that the book has been translated to Russian and made distribution in respectable volumes in Eastern Europe. And so I say, long live, mabuhay, Professor Jose Maria Zison, long live the working class, working, uh, long live proletarian international solidarity. And in ending, may I say, by the book. Thank you and good day to all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kabong. Long live the working class. Mabuhay ang uring manggagawa. Yes, so events must end, and so we have to say goodbye. Before we do, we would like to thank our reviewers, Bomen Guillermo, Jerry Imbong, Irina Malenko, uh, of course, the performers, the organizers, and special thanks to the technical and creative staff for making this book launch possible. Hmm. <laughs> Last but not least, <laughs> thank you to those who joined us for this online book launch. Oh, it's a all interested in purchasing a copy can get it online from Apple Books, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Also at La Solidaridad and popular bookstores in Manila, Philippines. We hope you enjoyed today's launch. Good morning and magandang gabi to everyone and looking forward to your support for the next volumes in the Season Leader Series. Isang bagsak! Please don't leave us yet because we will be playing your favorite song.
Isulong natin ang pagkakaisa Nang uring manggagawa at mawastasapa Ang ating sandigan sa pakikibaka Tungo sa pangbansang demokrasya Silang nagtataglay ng tunay na lakas Naluturong sa imperialismo Burokrata, kapitalismo, feudalismo Ang mga salot na pumapatay Hanggang mapawi ang pagsasamantala Isulong natin ang pagkakaisa Nang uring manggagawa at magsasaka Ang ating sandigan sa pakikibaka Tungo sa pambansang demokrasya Silang nagtataglay ng tunay na lakas Na dumurong sa imperialismo Burokrata, kapitalismo, feudalismo Ang mga salot na 